This is the Dairy Download brought to you by EverAg Insights and the International Dairy Foods Association, where we offer extra sharp market and policy insights on dairy. I'm your host, Phil Plord. Kathleen Wolfley is still on assignment, but we have my talented colleague, Katie Burgess, back for another episode. Hey, Katie. Hey, Phil. On today's episode, we are focusing on the state of the ag economy. We have two economists as guests this episode, each with interesting perspectives on the current ag economic climate. We'll get to that in a moment. First, here's a rundown on markets as of Monday, March 25. See me spot block cheddar, $1.43, down two cents from a week earlier. Barrels, same price, 143, down seven cents. We have Simi spot butter at 286 per pound, a new year-to-date high. Uh, that's up four cents from a week ago. Non-fat dry milk, kind of down in the dump still, $1.12, down two cents. All right, Katie, what's the most important thing right now? Well, Phil, I think it's one thing we've been carefully watching for a couple of weeks now. We started hearing in mid-March about a mysterious cattle disease in the Texas panhandle. And as of this week, USDA officially announced it seems like it's the avian flu impacting milk production down there. For herds impacted, it seems about 20% or so the cows will get sick. Those cows will see a substantial drop in milk production. Thankfully, though, the mortality rate seems to be pretty low. We do hear from contacts that most of those cows seem to be bouncing back within a few weeks, but not everyone makes a full recovery. But with that being said, there's still more questions than answers out there, I would say. Like, how quickly and widely will this disease spread? We are hearing some spots of of it maybe impacting other parts of the country. How are consumers going to react to the news? Still a lot of unanswered questions. Yeah, it's one of those frustrating stories, obviously, for the people that are dealing with the issue. But from an analysis standpoint, it's kind of hard. You know, know, when we do the back of the envelope math based on what we know today – it doesn't seem like a huge deal from a national supply perspective, but it's clearly a huge deal if you've got the issue on your farm. And to your point, there's still a lot of questions out there about where this could be going. So, you know, it's one of those things that's like, well, yeah, it could be no big deal in the aggregate or it could be a really big deal and we don't really know. And uh, that's kind of where we're at right now. For sure. Definitely uh, worth watching of how this is going to evolve. How about you, Phil? What's the most important thing in your neighborhood? Well, it's still this cheese market and it's struggle to gain any traction. It feels like whenever we get over 160, 165, we get a pretty harsh reminder that the world isn't really interested in our cheese at those prices and we get slapped back down. Plenty of interest below 150, it sounds like. But from a dairy farmer and producer income perspective, you know, gee, thanks, right? You know, we can sell a lot of cheese at a buck 50 or less, you know, isn't really the path to prosperity for dairy producers. And for the industry itself, it's just sort of a really kind of mediocre environment. And it persists. We keep waiting for it to shake free. Maybe it's just a, you know, we're, we're in March, spring flush is getting underway, and maybe it's just a seasonal thing that we got to get through before we see different results on the other side. But for now, it's it's still kind of a bummer. From a if you want to be bullish the cheese market, your uh, your good feelings are few and far between. Yeah, it's really been a frustrating one, I would say, for people all, on all sides. That exactly to your point, the dairy farmers I work with are not happy. It's tough times, but the forward curve shows much higher prices later this year, and so from a buy side perspective, it's hard to hedge the second half. Um, And it's hard to book those long-term export deals at these prices. So I don't know. The cheese market has just kind of been frustrating all around for folks, it seems like. Do you have a stat of the week? I do. I've got a big stat of the week. It's 48 million pounds. That is how much butter stocks increased during the month of February. That's 10 million pounds more than normal. And it ties for the second biggest February increase in, in 30 years. But to me, it's pretty interesting that despite putting all this butter in the warehouses during February, uh, here just yesterday, the butter market set a new high at 286. Um, It looks like March is going to settle at 283 for the NDPSR settlement, which would be a new all-time high for prices this time of year. Yeah, it's like, you know, that 
cold storage information in 450 will get you a tall latte, right? It really doesn't seem to be adding up to much in the marketplace. It, it just speaks to the to the lingering and deep concerns that end users have about higher prices. And I would say that from the from the manufacturer and marketer perspective, they seem inclined to hold on to the butter because for the same reason, just in case, you know, it's needed later. It's a very, it's kind of odd. For sure. I mean, I won't be surprised to see the market maybe trade a little bit lower here on the news, but it's hard to imagine any sort of big drop just given the anxiety out there. How about you, Phil? What's your stat of the week? Well, mine is plus 1.7%. And it plays into that butter story. We saw U.S. butter fat on farm production in the month of January up 1.7% year over year, despite the fact that milk production was down, was it 1.2% on a corrected basis? So we focus on milk production, appropriately so, and it's been down for what, seven, eight months in a row. But if you look at what's going on in the component area, the story is really, really different. The average fat test in the United States was 4.15% in 2023. That's up substantially over the past five to seven years. And so we would say that on a fat and solids basis, total milk solids basis, milk production in January actually may be a little bit ahead. Our component output was actually a little bit ahead of year prior levels where, while milk production was down. So um, you just got to dig a little bit deeper and say, well, how you know do we have this much butter and such you know in a down milk production environment? Well, components aren't down nearly as much as milk production, if at all. No, it's really interesting to see that at the end of the day, how many components are in the milk is really what matters in a world where we're busy making cheese and powder and, and butter. So uh, yeah, that headline milk production down number can be deceiving to folks because you know at the end of the day, there's still more milk solids heading into the manufacturing plants. It's fearless prediction time. What do you got? Ooh, Phil, I'm a little nervous, but I think that cheese prices are going to make their lows here in March. And next week, we kick off April. So I think the lows for the cheese market are in. And from here on out, um, starting in April, the cheese market won't see a print below 140 for the remainder of the year. So you're giving yourself a couple days this week and then no more sub 140 cheese. That's what I think. Hopefully demand picks up a little bit. We talked about these low prices. Maybe we can get some exports off. We'll see. I'm feeling a little nervous about it, but I do think the lows are going to be behind us. I'm going to make a far less bold prediction. I'm going to say that we will not see a dollar eighty cheese in Q2. So you're going to say the low is one forty or higher. I'm going to say the high is one eighty or lower. It's a big range, but I think that's the reality we're going to be in. No, I think you know forty cents between one forty and one eighty. It seems pretty safe. Um, and I'm sure it'll be noisy all around, just as it has been over the first quarter. I'm guessing that each of us will worry about our prediction at some point in the next 90 days. For sure. I think I might be first, though. <laughs> well, yeah, well, you're starting out on the edge. All right, let's get to our first guest. We are excited to welcome Corey Geiger to the show. Corey is a lead economist for dairy production and processing in CoBank's Knowledge Exchange Research Division. Before joining CoBank, Corey made a career of assessing the information and leadership needs of the dairy industry as managing editor of Hordes Dairyman's Magazine. Corey, we're glad to have you on the Dairy Download. Phil, I'm glad to be here. Let's get right into it. What do you see as the top factors that will influence the state of the ag and dairy economies this year? It starts with consumer demand, certainly domestic and international. Uh, and you guys know the consumer demand numbers as well as me, but January we had a little lackluster sales performance from American cheese, and that certainly uh, raises one's eyebrow. Uh, on the flip side, butter demand keeps climbing despite very robust prices at retail, and certainly in the U.S. we're even importing butter here right now. And I think when you look at what consumers are thinking, even though the dietary guidelines for Americans, which are starting to go through their revision process for the next duration. Consumers are recognizing the value of saturated fats, and they're making decisions on their own to eat healthy fats, and certainly dairy products is a, a significant source of them. So what are you seeing on the consumer and demand and Phil and Katie? I think that, that we're sort of in a week-ish 
economic environment, certainly for lower income consumers. And so I think that, you know, we watch the restaurant traffic numbers pretty carefully, Corey. We watch the um, IRI Circana data. And I think that, uh, yeah, butter's got a good tailwind against some weak comps, but I think butter still works. I, I think the cheese situation is more about food service and industrial demand than it is about at retail. And so I think that, and I think, you know, I'd be curious to take your view on this. You know, if you said, hey, Corey, you know, supply is down 1% in the U.S. is flat at best elsewhere in the world. You know, where's this cheese market going to be? It wouldn't be a dollar forty or a dollar fifty even. And I think that it seems possible that the consumer demand stories is it's, it's sort of lurking in the background. And, and, and we talk about supply all the time in dairy. But, um, you know, the demand is really the problem right now, both here in the U.S. as well as abroad. Certainly would agree with you. And I think, you know, there's some macroeconomic concerns here in the U.S. that are a little bit looming. And what really is going to happen with the economy, I think the biggest factor there is really the consumer or commercial real estate market. You know, places like New York City are doing really well, but cities like San Francisco have a 37 percent vacancy rate. And there'll be, a, you know, some kind of uh, recalibration here, whether it comes this year or in 2025. I do think, you know, when we look at the supply side, I think as an industry, we need to start looking away from measuring milk and really measuring components because milk's been flat. But when you look at butter fat, for example, from 2010 to 2023, butter fat production has been up almost 28% here in the U.S. versus you know milk production itself at 15%. And that's a big issue and a big factor to recalibrate our brains because 40 years ago, the market was 50% fluid beverage milk, and heck, that's only about 20% today. One other looming factor I just put, and we'll follow up on that in a little bit. I'm looking at the U.S. drought monitor map here. You know, we had a pretty mild winter, didn't have a lot of snow cover in some of the major dairy states. And, I, you know, I see little red forms, places forming in Iowa and through the Dakotas and uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin. And I was driving on our farm and I saw dust flying in a time that I never um, had seen dust in recent years. No, that's totally true. I know March ended up with a little bit of snow and rainfall, but, you know, we make the comment around here of you don't lose a corn crop to a drought in March or February, but soon enough, it is going to be planting time and all of those things really matter to where the market goes. In Cobank's year ahead report that was released at the end of 2023, you wrote about the continued growth of dairy product sales, but the decline of dairy products on the international market. When we're thinking about the international side, what do you see as the wild cards for the dairy sector here into 2024? Certainly, I think we got to start with the the blessing part of it. When you look at our market, our neighbors at the south have been uh, great customers here in recent years, and that that's certainly very important. But when you look at consumers in the United States, they've faced major headwinds, and that, that headwind is inflation. You know, we, we see reports that inflation is coming down, but I think all of us have to remember what cost a dollar in December 2019 is rough running a consumer about a dollar 20 right now. So even though inflation numbers are tempering, it's not like product prices are coming down. So taking that global, I think. Consumers, many parts of the world, especially Southeast Asia, which is America's second largest uh, market, have faced even higher rates of inflation than Americans, and that reduces their buying power. And so even though consumers understand that the proteins found in milk are the most complete and beneficial known to humanity, they still have to be able to afford to buy them. There's one thing worse than inflation, and it's uh, deflation, and I'm saving that biggest wild card for last, and certainly dairy exports start with China. So while many parts of the world have faced inflation, China is facing deflation. And in that deflation causes uh, people to hold their money and wait for a better price tomorrow. But the question is, when does tomorrow come? So that's a big deal in China. They buy 20% of the traded dairy products around the world. And China is also having a little bit of trouble in their real estate sector. They have a lot of um, vacant and empty buildings as well, and foreign investments falling. And now they're also opening up a program to uh, streamline visas for international visitors. So a lot of things they're trying to do to perk up the economy. But the question is, what does it mean for dairy and dairy demand? I think the real, one of the real big questions and all that is, you know, in some of these countries where we've seen major declines in imports and food inflation, I would concur is a big deal. 
The question is, what does it take to get back in those countries where dairy isn't necessarily a core staple offering, right? When rice prices are up 30%, you know, ready to drink kind of dairy stuff that's faltering in the Philippines or a place like that, and that may not come back tomorrow. I think that would be the concern for, for me. I don't know what you think about that. You're certainly right. That's not going to come back tomorrow. Uh, and it's something we got to work on quite a bit more. And given, uh, you know, the politics of in America right now and whatever people think about the election, we're not going to see any new free trade agreements anytime soon. And so in lieu of that, we have to work on reducing these non-tariff trade barriers. And that that's part of the puzzle. But again, those are long, long-term plays. You and I've talked a little bit about farmland values. Um, they're still strong. W- what do you attribute the buoyancy of those values with rates high? And how do you see that playing out going forward? Phil, I started drinking some of this out of a fire hose, not only uh, with my day-to-day job, but in 2019, my 69-year-old father passed away suddenly. So now I'm getting to own and manage a 40, 400-acre dairy farm or uh, in crop farm. So I I know the economics of that well. We've had uh, three years of very good farm profitability on the crop side of it. And that's led to a lot more aggressive land acquisition by farmers. And that land acquisition can be twofold. It could be purchasing land or competing to acquire it via rental contracts. So while the rates of land appreciation have leveled off over the past two quarters, me and my teammates at CoBank, don't think there's a lot of risk in land prices falling. And that's certainly because balance sheets are still largely in good shape for crop farmers. And another indication that balance sheets are in good shape is there's a lot of corn and soybeans being held by crop farmers. Then They're not taking the market because they can wait it out a little bit. Certainly that'll change as the we enter the cropping season. But uh, the other part here is outside investors continue to look at farmland to diversify their investment portfolios. So I think land's going to hold strong. It may not appreciate, it might have leveled off here, but uh, it's going to hold. With that, Corey, you know, we've already touched on a lot of topics here. There are so many things that are impacting our agricultural markets, whether it's agricultural things themselves or outside influences on it. So for you, what is the most surprising change or trend that you've seen in agriculture and dairy over the last 12 months? And how do you think it plays out here through 2024? I've been crisscrossing the country here from coast to coast and border to border in 15 states and since the beginning of the year. And the topic when I go to dairy meetings that everybody brings up is replacements and beef on dairy. It's a developing story, certainly. It's beyond the uh, immediate 12 months. But that story for me, you know, beef on dairy has been going on since 2017, but picking up steam. But in November, I started getting text from dairy farmers. I'm the immediate past president of Holstein Association USA, and they were texting me looking for replacements, and my ears perked up. And that caused me to pre-write a paper called Dwindling Dairy Heifer Numbers May Inhibit New Milk Production. So I wrote it before the January 31st numbers came out from USDA. I expected a revision, but I didn't expect a 263,000 revision on heifers 500 pounds and greater. But this whole story is driven by economics. I mean, if you could sell a dairy replacement for $1,200 in 2019, I'm going to look for different ways to generate revenue on the farm. And so in the U.S. dairy industry and beef industry, there were 2.5 million units of beef semen sold in 2017. The numbers that just came out in 2023 has jumped up to 9.4 million. And the trade association that sells bull and beef semen, National Association of Animal Breeders, did some data research this year. 84%, 84% of all the beef semen made in the United States was sold to dairy farmers last year. So that's a lot. And considering five years ago, it was probably a million units. So now we have like three to 3.25 million head of animals in this country that came from a beef bull and a dairy mama. And, and that's not going to turn back. So my father-in-law, a dairy farmer, went to the Milwaukee stockyards just to see how these beef on dairy calves were selling. He sat there for two hours, didn't see one sell for $800, and most of them were 9 to nine fifty. So a dairy farmer can clip a coupon, sell a calf at two to three days old, and, and generate 9 to nine fifty for that. So I, the trend's not going to go away, but I think 
certainly dairy farmers are going to make their dairy heifer calves and make their beef, beef calves. They're not going to sit there and play around this 50-50 proposition uh, moving forward. So it's a major story. Corey, I've had the pleasure of seeing you give a couple of talks over the past year and you spend some time talking about sustainability issues, methane digesters. How do you see that playing into the dairy economy over the near and medium term? It's a really good question, Phil. And there's really what people ask, how can I generate more revenue to my milk check? 92% of the milk is priced on multiple component prices. So produce more protein, produce more butter fat. Beef on dairy is another opportunity. And then really sustainability, and there's a lot of sustainability means so much to different people and they all have different definitions, but the digester story is a uh, one that's growing. It's been out there. Production of compressed re renewable natural gas from methane digesters is adding about 40 cents per hundred weight or $100 per cow to dairy farm income here. I, that's one part of the story. I think uh, inset markets could develop too for make doing practices on dairy farms, not only in the farm, but those that, on cropland. You know, we have to have more definitions on this. Our My teammates at CoBank are working on some of this as well because th there's a good value proposition. And I think the other thing that we don't talk about in the dairy industry a lot is the um, value that genetics have. Uh, in this story as well, I I did one little project here of um, kind of relaying it. One of the major uh, bull studs in the United States, ABS Global, built a new facility, and they had 480 bulls in there in that facility. And, and they put solar panels in there to run it. And if you take 10 years of uh, carbon savings from those solar panels, it equals just one month from all the genetic gain of those bulls and the semen sold from those bulls in one month. So the power of genetics and genomics, the study of DNA is really transforming the U.S. dairy industry. And it's as fast and dynamic as this uh, beef on dairy situation. Wow, Corey, those are some pretty interesting statistics. I would have never guessed. One last question for you. As you've been around traveling, talking to folks from coast to coast, in your opinion, what's the current sentiment around the ag and dairy economic outlook for 2024? That really depends on what part of the country you're in. That and then it's I've been to different areas, and you, when you listen to dairy producers and those that support them, there's optimism in the Northeast, and it's a lot about new plant expansion. I believe there's dairy farmers in New York and around the surrounding areas that are looking forward to growing milk volume once those open up. Because again, the economics to produce milk are pretty favorable. With the falling prices for corn and soybean meal, dairy farmers in the upper Midwest are looking forward to opportunities. Class three markets are also a little bit concerned about the inverted class three to class four price ratio. Many of them aren't used to that. Could be hanging around here for a year or two at, at the least. So that their, their questions are how long will it last? How will that uh, new cheese capacity coming online and the $7 billion investment in plants impact everything? No, that's a lot of new cheese. If the number is correct, 520,000 metric tons, that's 1.1 billion pounds of cheese. So a lot of cheese will be searching for a new home. But the dairy farmers are still optimistic because I think they're they're ready to supply the plants. Optimism's probably a little less in the Southwest, particularly New Mexico, maybe even Arizona, because of some of the feed economics that are taking place. And then there's the issue in the Southeast. There's While there's been some growth in milk production in Georgia and Florida's been holding its own, those other 14 states in the Southeast are keep shrinking. And a looming issue for the dairy industry is how do we get fluid beverage milk down to that region and to serve schools and consumers in there? So that, that's a little bit of a looming question. But I would say overall, producer sentiment is cautiously optimistic. Well, on that note, Corey, thank you so much for joining us on the Dairy Download. Pleasure, Phil and Katie. Now, let's hear from Dr. Michael Swanson from Wells Fargo. We are excited to welcome Dr. Michael Swanson back to the show. Dr. Swanson is the Chief Agricultural Economist within Wells Fargo's Agri-Food Institute. His work includes analysis of energy impacts on agriculture and strategic analysis for key ag commodities and livestock sectors with a focus on consumer food demand and its linkage back to agribusiness. Dr. Swanson, thank you for joining us on the Dairy Download. 
It's always a pleasure to talk to such a great team that's interested in agriculture and dairy. Yeah, and uh, the consumer, right? One of the things that we've been focusing on in our own analysis, and we see others focusing on it, is consumer debt mounting, uh, particularly credit card debt. We saw recent data for January, balances at all-time highs, seems to be growing without much slowdown. What does it mean, if anything, for the ag economy to see consumer credit expand at such a rapid rate? You know, it doesn't really mean much to the ag economy into food consumption. Now, uh, let's break that down. I mean, we all love statistics. You know, sports statistics are something we all talk about. You could say somebody has a real terrible batting average, but if they hit a lot of home runs, you're going to want to have them up at the plate more often than not, right? So you have to look at these statistics very carefully. I mean, what does it mean to me? So consumer debt, let's talk about that. People use credit cards today as a form of payment as well as a form of financing, first off. You know, a lot of people tap that card but they don't intend to finance it because they're not going to get cash out or a checkout. So first off, we'd expect credit card debt to grow. The question is how much of that credit card debt is financed and how much of that is just a form of payment, first point. Second point is $28 trillion economy at the end of 2023 in nominal terms, the biggest economy we've ever had. So we would expect to have the greatest amount of debt ever as well against that largest economy. And so what we should be looking at is stress in that portfolio, write-offs, defaults, delinquencies, and that's really low on a historical point right now. But the credit card debt portfolio, just because it's large, is not really flashing a red signal in a lot of ways. You know, if, if, if incomes were going down and consumer credit was going up, that would be a problem. But actually, I think my look at January was the ratio actually went down a little bit versus your prior levels because incomes have been rising. But let's speak to the consumer strain, right? The the delinquency numbers are higher. They're not where they were in 2007, 8, 9, which was the big peak. Where do you see this going, though? I mean, I think this is a function of the, you know, yes, we use our credit cards more, but also inflation, consumers sort of struggling to, to make ends meet, if you will, or, or you know, having to, to do more. Do you see any negative food impacts, food demand impacts today from, let's just call it the overall economic circumstances? Absolutely not. You know, this is a point I make over and over again at organizations is food spending is the last thing to be touched by anybody. I mean, it's something you do all the time. You make a lot of choices, eat this, eat that, eat in, eat out. All those things are always going on. But let's go back and look at 2008, 2009, the biggest recession we've had in decades, the Great Recession. 5% of Americans lost their job. Personal consumption expenditure on food as measured by the government month on month never went down. In fact, spending away from home went down half a percent from peak to trough. And that's, you can give that up pretty easily. So the consumer is incredibly resistant when it comes to the food set spending side. And then you think about dairy as a percent of total food spending, it's a smaller fraction of that smaller piece. And so the consumer is not going to save their way out of a crisis by not buying milk and cheese. It's just not going to happen. They can complain about it, but they're not going to do anything about it. That's interesting stuff. Let's pivot a little bit from the consumer to what we see happening on the farm side of the economy. As we look at, you know, where give us an update on where are things at? Which factors do you think are the biggest impacts right now to how the U.S. farm economy fares over the next year or so? Good point. So let's kind of work break out two big segments. Let's talk the dairyman first. You know, $25, $27, 100 weight mailbox prices back in 2022, 20, early part of 2023, really put a lot of cash on the balance sheet. I mean, they have a lot of fixed costs. So when prices are up, cash flow is great. When prices are down, they still have a lot of fixed costs. And so they run up a lot of cash. So they're making a lot of decisions right now. How much expansion do I really want to do you know, as, as a total operation. Now, the saving grace has been feed costs have come down dramatically. So if you're looking at replacing what's in the feed bunk in 2024 with what you had in there in 2023, you're going to fill it up a lot cheaper. So the lower milk price is negative, but the feed price is very positive. But let's step back to that, to the crop side of, of the business. I'm going to call it clean up on aisle four because they went from $7 corn 14 to $18 soybeans 
down to 370 cash corn in Western Minnesota, they have to make a lot of hard choices about cash rents. When you look at major producers, when you look at the people that really move the market, say 3,000 or more acres, in Minnesota, which is very representative of the Midwest, 80 plus percent of their acreage that they farm is rented. And you don't change rent prices by negotiation. You change rent prices by stepping away from a relationship. And there's a lot of rents out there that were agreed to when it was $7 corn that make no sense whatsoever with 425 corn. And they're kind of into it for 2024. But 2025, which is going to be negotiated from October to November of this year, if we still have 425 corn, 450 corn on the board for 2025, there's going to be a lot of hard decisions. And the, the biggest decision most crop farmers make, which feeds the dairy cows, which feeds a lot of things, is what's the cash rent? You know, a lot of them would stick with it for a year or two and lose money because they don't want to walk away and then have it pay for them. Those are all interesting things, too, that we hear from producers. I would say another stress point that has become a talking point here of late that we hadn't talked about some felt like for a long time is the impact of interest rates. How do we see that playing out this year? And how is that going to change the decisions that producers make going ahead? Everybody got lulled into the idea that you could take on more leverage because interest rates were low. I mean, if you go back to 2008, 2009, when they really pushed short-term interest rates to zero for the first time ever. People discovered that additional debt really didn't cost you that much in terms of the interest. Now, you always have the principal repayment, so don't never never forget that. Bankers always want to remind you about principal repayment as well. But with low interest rates the way they were, people were able to expand leverage. And leverage is a great thing. You know, I always say this to dairymen. Look, the dosage makes the poison. If, if you have a headache and you take two aspirin, your headache goes away. If you have a headache and you take 200 aspirin, you go away. It's not the aspirin's fault, okay? So we've really had low interest rates for a long time, and we changed the ratios we thought were appropriate for leverage. Now we have five and a quarter, and it's not coming down as fast as people had hoped. So it's tough to make these adjustments. You got to retain earnings, got to earn your way out of these problems, and that doesn't happen in a month. But I don't think we're going to go back to really ultra cheap interest rates anytime soon. So. Dairy men are going back to a long-term question, what's the right leverage? And interest rates reflect a lot of things that are outside their control. So it, it's it's kind of a almost a multi-generational decision going on right now is what's the right lo- level of leverage? How do you see that playing out? I mean, you know, I think I get the whole normalization of rates thing. I think Wall Street's been wrong about interest rates just about every day, all day long. So let's just say state rates stay in the sort of, you know, 5% Fed funds area, you know, 8% long-term rates kind of deal. What do you think that manifests itself in terms of a few things? Dairy expansion and let's just say farm values. Great points. So let's talk about this, debt versus equity. If you go back over 25 years and we have the data, that kind of return to asset is like 4.2% in dairy. Not that high. But return to equity is a little bit higher because you can juice it with a little bit of of, of leverage. But if interest rates are going to be at six, seven or eight percent, it's like, yeah, you don't want to take that on as a way to juice your returns because it's costing you more than you're paying yourself. And so you say, yeah, I'd rather finance myself than go to the market to finance it. So I think if it stays higher longer, people will definitely take down the leverage. And that, like I said, just mentioned that that's a big time long term thing. And it it really is interesting because people have to make these decisions painfully almost day by day to get there. So land values, corn, you know, prices, you know, I mean, we're, you know, we were seven plus at one point, not not so long ago, kind of staring down at four ish right now, cost of money. Uh, land values have held up remarkably well because, you know, they're not making any more of it, apparently. And you have, you know, all kinds of forces acting in that marketplace. Do you think things cool off? Do you th- see any risks to to just sort of general farm balance sheets from a retreat in land values or a plateauing? Let's, let's work our way through it because it's a great question. So who buys land and why? So we have the producer, whether it's a crop producer or a dairy operator. And they buy it for a very different reason. You know, they need it for operational purposes. 
but they also are somewhat sensitive to returns. So right now, 10-year treasury is 4.1%, 4.2% as we're talking here. Add on 250 basis points, you're borrowing money to buy land at 6.5%. If you take current cash rents versus current land prices in average, your yield cash on cash is about 3% or a little bit under. So it's not a great kind of comparison there. If I'm an outside investor and I can get 4.1% for hanging out to 10-year treasuries versus land, I have a better investment. I'll just why would I buy the land? There's some appreciation over time, but cash on cash, I'm better off just sitting on my cash. Secondly, unless there is what's called PIT, principal, interest, and taxes. Those land taxes are also a very nasty little piece of the land equation that a lot of people forget about. You got to and we've seen a lot of local governments turn to real estate taxes as a source of funding in a big way, especially Nebraska versus Iowa, things like that. So it's not a great yield right now. So a lot of the outside investors are saying, no, thank you. So when you take those buyers out of the pool, you have less demand, less pricing. Because price is about competition. And if you're not making that great return, you're not going to make the same purchase. Plus, we've run up. You, you made a great point. They've been really good. We might have a long pause at the top of this market. But I guarantee you, when you look at last year's prices in the land market, they're not very attractive on a on a cash on cash yield basis. And if interest rates stay higher, like we talked about, they're not going to be very attractive in the short term either. Do you think that the production ag communities asleep on that a little bit? Have we been kind of lulled into a sense of complacency because, I mean, things are just going up, 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 up? Or do you think that there's a little wariness out there that, that you know, things may not be as great tomorrow as they were yesterday in that regard? There's a great amount of complacency in the land market. Now, I want to be very clear. Land is a great investment. It's going to have value long term. Just put it out there. But when and how much do you pay for it have to also be operative questions when it's 80 plus percent of the balance sheet in agriculture. Okay, so let's think about that. Let's go back in the Wayback Machine. We put ethanol into the land market in the early 2000s. We had $1.75 corn. We introduced a new demand for corn across the entire country that gave us almost 12 unhundred years of higher prices, where the land market was always trying to catch up to the new price of corn. Simultaneously, we went from 10-year treasuries in, 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 the, in the market at 6 to 7% down to 2%. So the financing cost of land went down continuously while the price of corn went up continuously. So uh, an asset that had been undervalued for a long time suddenly had a hurricane blowing at its back. Now, is it going to have that hurricane forever? The answer is no, absolutely not. And we have to say, they're not making any more farm ground in the United States, but they're breaking out more farm ground in Brazil. So don't forget, it's a global market. So yes, we have been lulled into complacency by falling interest rates and rising crop prices for the better part of two decades. That's not a guarantee, and that's not going to be a forever trend on an ongoing basis. Dr. Swanson, I think that was a good transition because I wanted also to pick your brain about the global agricultural economy before we let you go today, too. You know, in 2023, especially from a dairy perspective, we saw lackluster demand It with some countries. Um, other places like Mexico stepped up to take more products from the U.S. from a dairy perspective. What do you see heading into 2025 as we think about global agricultural trade? You know, I think it's going to be, you know, moderate, you know, and probably the biggest people piece that we take our cue from is China. You know, I have a blog coming out on China. China was a once in a lifetime demand change. I mean, they went from absorbing, let's just say on a running basis before 2002, about two to 3% of US exports on a kind of a run basis to 20% by 2012. Who does that? I mean, who has the checkbook to absorb that kind of demand on an ongoing basis? What we've seen is a great plateauing since about 2013, 14 with China. They're not going away. They most certainly are not going away. China is stable, but not growing. It's not a bad thing, but it's certainly not the dynamic of growth that we are so used to. One last point on China before we step away from them. When you look at Chinese 
farm gate revenue. That's what the Chinese report saying what the farmers earned in China. And then compare it to our exports to them, which include food, which is more value added. We're only two to two and a half percent of the value of their farm gate. They can live without us if they want to. If they don't want to, they like our product, but it's two to two and a half percent of their farm grade gate revenue. So yeah, China is the thing that we have to keep an eye on. We can have optimism around people still eating, even among sort of evolving and sometimes tur turbulent economic circumstances. We might be less excited about the global situation on tr trade potential. What's the general sentiment from Dr. Michael Swanson right now about the state of the ag economy? And what are we looking at for the remainder of 2024? You know, I'm, I'm bullish, but it's bullish on an individual basis. So let me, let's be very, very clear. Agriculture is accomplished by individuals, people. And people are in a different stage of their life cycle. I mean, you have some older producers who have decided I'm going to retire in two or three to five years. They're not going to make these investments. They're not going to make the hard changes to stay on top of technology. They're on an exit path. The assets they own are going to be picked up by somebody else. So agriculture is this continuous evolution of people. And we know technology is not stopping. And so I'm very bullish. We're going to do so much more with the new technology, whether it's capital or genetics or whatever. But each individual within agriculture has to ask themselves, what do I enjoy? Why do I enjoy it? And am I good at what I do? Agriculture in general is going to do extremely well. But the individuals within it really want to have an honest, a conversation with somebody who has their best interest at heart and can really give them good counsel about what's the best use for those assets that you own. So agriculture is going to do great. Food's going to do great. And the individuals within it are going to do okay if they're honest with themselves and say where they want to be three and five years from now. And it moves fast, right? I mean, it, the pace of things is not slowing down and not likely to anytime soon. You're exactly right. And think about that. If you're not making changes every year, you're just setting yourself up for either heartbreak or tremendous struggle. So this is a good year to make some changes. Some stuff that you should have been doing last year, do it this year. On that note, always great to check in with you, Dr. Swanson. Thank you so much for joining us on the Dairy Download. Always a pleasure to talk to this group. That's a wrap for today's show. Thanks to Katie for filling in. As always, we want to thank our production team, Matt Herrick, Mariah McKenzie, Michael Gooden, and Andrew Drum at IDFA and the Insights team over here at EverAg Insights. If you're interested in what Katie and I do for our day jobs, check us out at ever.ag. Remember, if you enjoy the show, hit the subscribe button and leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. Thanks for listening to The Dairy Download. Until next time, stay sharp.